Welcome to Women Kicking Glass, the only radio show on OC Talk Radio dedicated to empowering women to be the best leaders they can be in any endeavor they choose. Patty Grimm is our host and interviews top women in a variety of fields to help women grow, learn, and lean in together. Patty has over 25 years of experience in primarily male-dominated fields in senior-level management positions. Patty is the owner of Advantage Training Limited, an organizational leadership team training company. She recently released her new book for women called Quiet Women Never Changed History. Be strong, stand out, and stand up. With the subtitle, Let's Go Kick Some Glass. And that's exactly what we're going to do today with some real glass kickers here. <laughs> Welcome, Patty. Hi, thanks, Paul. I've got a, a really great guest with me today. She's actually an incredible woman. Her name's Kathy Johnson. Uh, she started out in the construction business uh, many years ago when probably there were very few, if any, women in the construction business except you. Uh, but she's now CEO for Vital Link, a nonprofit organization um, that really looks at how do you bridge that vital link uh, between industry and education. And how do you help students, your children, your grandchildren, your nieces or nephews find their passion in their careers? And it really helps them explore that. So it's an incredible organization. I mean, as CEO, she obviously oversees you know, strategic planning and operations and fundraising and everything to do with a nonprofit. And I know there are a lot of people out there, maybe women in the audience, that think they want to be part of a nonprofit or run a nonprofit. So we want to talk about that. We're also going to talk about that vital link between helping kids, our children, or your nieces, nephews, grandchildren, kind of create that link between what they learn in school and uh, industry and education. So thanks, Kathy, for joining oh, me today. Thank you for having me. This so, is great. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about you, a little bit sure. about your background and how you went from construction to CEO Into, of a nonprofit. Yeah, interesting. It, well, it actually starts a little bit be, even before that. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, the, it really wasn't relevant to me. I didn't see the connection between where I wanted to go in life and, and what I was learning in school. And I had a few classes that were intriguing to me. But when um, they said, oh, you're really good at math and here's some options for you. And, and those were things that were not interesting to me because I tend to be a creative person. Right. And so my math skills really were very valuable for me when I got into the construction area. Really? And the very first house that I I designed was my own home. Um, I was married at a young age, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided we bought some land and decided to build our own home. So I designed the home, and worked with the uh, with work with draftsmen and, and right. architects with my concept design. And but there's a lot of math in construction. I don't think people know that. Well, yes. How much now? How much cement are you going to need to order to build your foundation? What's the elevations and, and treads that you need for going up a stairwell? Uh, there's all sorts of, of um, things that um, con uh, mathematics and construction are, are critical. But that was also intriguing to me because it was creative. It was taking raw dirt, land, looking at it and saying what would be the ideal home and started out with what would be the ideal home for me and right. then moved on into buying land for other people. As a part of that, um, owning that company, expanded it into the property management world as well mm -hmm. in the area of homeowners associations and then became very involved with my professional association, which was the Building Industry Association of Southern California and right. a subgroup underneath that called the Home Builders Council. And that was the educational linkage that, ah. that got me into meeting the people within the education system, predominantly at the um, county level, the Orange mm -hmm. County Department of Education. And my industry was looking at a time when we were doing a lot of construction of residential house tracts in, mm -hmm. in the county and they needed workforce. And, yeah. and we said, what's the pipeline for that workforce? And we found <laughs> that the shop classes, which uh, were in the, in the classroom at that time in the schools were more, I call them hobbyist classes, bird yeah. houses and tissue boxes. Yeah. You, what I, yeah, I call yeah, them. yeah. you build bird houses and tissue right. boxes. I remember that. Yeah. And so we said, can we turn those into actual construction academies where they're learning real residential construction and all elements of it, not right. just the trades, but being the project manager, being the, the purchasing agent, being, uh, that architect, all phases of it to give those students an understanding mm -hmm. of what the possibilities are within the construction industry. 
And our work there um, has was built 30 years ago. We started a construction competition um, 16 years ago, started this the classroom element mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And those programs are still in existence and have become models for others. And now in the industry or in education, they want to do what we did 30 and, and, and eight, uh, 16 years ago in all industry sectors. Right. And so when I had children, I worked with the elementary school they were in mm-hmm. and we did some what we call project based learning and problem solving and, and what we use in today's language, soft skills. Yeah. Uh, problem solving. And we had a theory that we could combat peer, negative peer pressure. If young children could learn how to make decisions and understood consequences exactly. and what would happen if you chose this option versus this option. And all of those pieces together, the work I did with in construction, the work I did in the school system with the soft skills, all led me eventually to an organization called Vital Link. Right, right. So, interest, so the, there's so much in what you said that was so relevant for the audience. There's a number of parents out there that I'm sure are struggling with maybe a child who may be good at math or maybe good Mm -hmm. at something, but they just don't fit the school system. They're not thinking about the university. Mm -hmm. And right now the construction is booming. Uh, And there's a women's uh, construction council meeting I went to in San Diego and they're dying for people. There are bidding wars for good project managers or people looking for skills specifically for women. So if your daughters or your even sons are interested in something, you know, ask them to figure out how to get in touch with Vital Link or organizations like this. It can help them get into that industry and get skills. Yeah. The, the women in construction groups are excellent. Yeah. Uh, the Building Industry Association is, I'm, I'm going to call magnificent. They are very dedicated yeah. to supporting the um, school uh, programs. They have, uh, through these 16 years, have dedicated uh, their funding, their resources <laughs> to what we called at the beginning Building Industry Technology Academies. Right. We have nine of those in Orange County. And that model was picked up by their uh, statewide organization and uh, through their foundation, the California Builders uh, Foundation, uh, or Building Industry Foundation. And they are now replicating that um, Building Industry Technology Academies around the state. And also the construction competition that we started, as I said, 30 years ago, yeah. is also being replicated. Yeah. So awesome. those those seeds and seeing how those uh, programs succeeded when it came to Vital Link, um, they were they had written um, soft skills curriculum. Right. And the founders of Vital Link were actually Roger Johnson, who was president of uh, Western Digital at the time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and individuals out of UCI actually were the founders of Vital Link. In uh, 1995, and then when I came on in 2001, they had the curriculum that they had written around soft skills. Right. I was very familiar with that because of the work I did yeah. in my children, own children's school when they were in elementary yeah. school. And came on board and said, we need to, what, what can we do to elevate the um, kind of the impact of what right. we're doing through Vital Link? And created a whole model around experiential learning, which allows students to get out into the field and see what's going on. And when those light bulb moments, we call them, they see their passions, their talents align with careers in a specific industry field that they had an interest in, but didn't know where they fit. That's where the magic moment happens. And they then can plan and do an education plan, can pick the right classes early on in high school, and then moving on into, um, into the uh, college um, you know, college or post-secondary uh, yeah. education level. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think we might want to think about is that you, you instead of training kids how to learn things in a book, you're teaching them how to think and solve problems. And, mm-hmm. and one thing, and I'm a word freak, so, you know, mm-hmm. so words mean a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to maybe consider, and I know this is very much in the school system, I think we may have even talked about it, but we need to get rid of the term soft skills. That sounds like soft, kumbaya, <laughs> let's hug each other. Um, th- these are professional business skills. They're not soft skills. And I think we need to work with schools and people to start to change that language to say these are professional skills. These are business skills. You're teaching kids how to make decisions and how to decide how much cement they need and how how high to make the building and what's code. And so I think we need to well, those think are the about technical those skills. Yeah. yeah. Those are technical skills. Right. But um, still the, the but, business skills, yes. like how do you solve the problem? Yeah. 
yes, problem solving, critical thinking. We, we've a vital link recently uh, produced 10 career videos, um, which was um, uh, funded through a, a source through the Irvine school district. Right. And we call it beyond the interview um, keys to success. So it goes to your point mm-hmm. and it is not the skills you need to get the job, the interview, the preparation, how do you dress, right. those kinds of things. It's how do you, how do you communicate to multiple supervisors, which at an entry level position you often have, right. that all have different communication styles. Right. What style of, inf- what style of communication do they want to get their information in? And what kind of style of communication do they want to communicate to you? And uh, knowing how to adapt to that and right. recognizing those. So that's yeah. just an example of yeah. of that kind of thing. We're in a crossroads of language right now. Yeah. Life skills is one that's being used very heavily. Soft skills is actually codified into the educational code. Right. Uh, and so changing that one is a, a little bit tougher. But you're right. Professional skills... Um, on the job um, skills yeah. are are very very important and very different. Right. And uh, so our our curriculum that we work with and and promote or and or write is very much those skills that you need to navigate through the um, the work day. Right. And be successful. Um, I have a an example of when do you know you're done completed right? And we see a lot of young people who think that they're done when they've hit a wall. And they and they don't know how where to go. Right. And so that kind of um, initiative is really, really valued. If you know when you hit that wall, you know how to react, where to go, what direction to take, right. who, maybe who to ask questions of and then where you go from there. So those are the kinds of things that we we yeah. really stress and emphasize in the programs that we um, we support. And how to understand that sometimes when you're having a conflict with someone, a supervisor mm-hmm. or a coworker. It may not, it may simply be that the two of you have different styles for solving a problem Mm -hmm. or different styles of communicating. And so it's not that either one of you are bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's simply a different style, a different preference. Please don't take it personally. Right? Right. It's it's not a personal thing. Yeah. It's It's a communication. It's a communication thing. Yeah. And you've got to work through that and figure out how the best way to get those messages across or understood. So you talked about light bulbs and I know we talked before about some, some examples of some Mm -hmm. students where. (laughs) <laughs> they just didn't feel like their their parents were frustrated. The kids were frustrated because they just didn't feel they fit in school. But yet they found Vital Link, mm-hmm. and it completely changed their lives. Mm-hmm. So tell us about one of the, one yeah, of those examples. We have, we have, you probably and, and, have and thousands the, of them. I do, but we have one, in, especially in in construction. Um, he again good in math, and uh, but just couldn't see himself working in a bank or working as a financial um, analyst or, or, being, or a being a teacher, being any of the traditional or more commonly known things in the area of math. And he went on a field trip and admittedly it was to get out of class. And he went on a field trip <laughs> to a construction site. Yeah. And we took it, them to a construction site where they met all of the people that were a participant in building a home. And, and this was a housing track. So they got to see a house built in a day. They met the architect when they arrived. They went and saw the foundation. They saw the framing and all the way through to the model home. And he found out when he met with the surveyors that they use trigonometry. And that word didn't scare him because he knew trigonometry, but he didn't know it applied in civil engineering and surveying. And he was just fascinated by that. But it also was physical. It was outdoors. Yeah, because you mentioned day he is lo- different. He loved the outdoors. Yes. He loved everything about. But every day is different, and they they're on they drive really cool trucks that go up really high <laughs> steep hills, and all kinds of things. And now they're using GPS devices, and they're out there doing things. And he found that that was interesting. Well, we then subsequently had another event, which was called Trickstar, and it was a trigonometry competition. But it was sponsored by the California Land Surveyors Association. And it was at one of the colleges that has a whole program in surveyor right. training and getting certified in that area. And he came out and, and uh, parents were welcome to come. It was a Saturday. The, the school came to us and said, Kathy, we want to do this trigonometry test and competition. And we want uh, as many kids as you can get in. Oh, by the way, it's at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And that was our challenge. So we yeah. created a dynamic event with industry people there, with exhibits and a and a field 
um, competition plus the test. And so he came with his mother and the two of them formed a team and they did the field test together. And uh, then his mom came up to me and she was really very, very appreciative and, and really emotional in sharing the story that this was a program that her son really resonated with. He, he dragged her there, not right. the other way around. And he ended up signing up for um, a class in the summer. Uh, he was not a um, senior yet, but he, you know, went, took the summer class. So he got prerequisites going into the uh, school and the class and he became one of the top students. It, it was a transformational thing for him to see how his world changed for other students that were construction students that came to that and did the math and did this. They weren't frightened because they knew the surveying skill sets. Right. And they applied it and they did well in the trigonometry test. Had they known that it was trigonometry, they went, oh, I, that's, I can't do that. But, oh, it's measuring the distance and the height and the angles and yeah. things. And we did that out in the field, out in the, you know, at the campus. And they approached trigonometry from a, from a field application process. And that lowered the barrier of fear for taking trigonometry. This young man knew trigonometry. He just yeah. didn't know how it applied in the field. Right. Right. I mean, that's such a great story because I know so many parents out there are, you know, the it seems to be nowadays that it's a must that you go to college, whether you mm-hmm. fit in college or not. And and it may you may need to go to college to get some of the things that you need. But mm-hmm. what if you just don't fit? What if you just don't fit that mold? Or like you said, he had a passion for the outdoors mm-hmm. and he found a job where he could use his math skills. He could use his love of the outdoors, drive cool trucks and have a career that he yeah. and just excel. And sometimes, too, Patty, it's not only college, it's the right college. Yes. We've had young people come to us and go, how do I tell my parents I should have gone to Cal State Fullerton instead of UCI? Um, I really wanted to be in marketing. And that's where all the networking is going on with marketing. Right. And now we've spent this money and I graduated and and I don't have any experience in marketing. And that's what I really discovered while I was there. I have a term. And I want everybody to start using this and being aware of it. Okay. In industry, we call it ROI, return on investment. Industry uses that all of the time. Analyzing the value of making a, a financial decision and what is our return on the investment of a new piece of equipment, a right. new employee, new location, right. etc. So we're going to throw the word education into the middle of that. So it's R-O-E-I. R-O-E-I. E-I. What's the return on education investment? And with today's, the news is filled with student and large student loans. And how do they manage that? And if a student is using college to figure out what they want to be in or the direction that they want to take from scratch, you're Ooh. not going to have a very good ROEI. But if you can do your exploration, and it's a little bit like a funnel two funnels on top of each other, right? Right. So you have this wide swath of opportunities, all these different industry sectors and things that you, you're interested in. Then you narrow it down and say, you know what? I'm interested in medical or I'm interested in, in digital media arts or construction. That narrowed it down to the little tube. And you're going through that and kind of living in that world. Yeah. And then the tube opens up again, very wide, because within each of those industry sectors, are all of these jobs. All these jobs. Yeah, and a lot of the jobs they don't even know about. So, for example, in medical, we do this event called Medical Careers in Action. Right. We reenact surgeries. Now, you talked about this, then I can mm. just imagine that they actually get to see a surgery or they reenact yeah. it. A mock surgery. But without, to without them, blood. it feels real. Without blood. Right. But there's blood on the screen. They get to see, a, the. there's a video of a real surgery. We do laparoscopic surgeries so that you have a video when that camera goes down the tube and inside and move, maneuvers through the body, finding the right organ that you're going to be working on, um, you see that video. So there is blood in in the video, but not as much as you would see uh, even going to a really bad slasher movie on TV or something. <laughs> but the but what's interesting is that they students are interested in medical, so they come, but they learn about the careers of all of the people who have an interaction with a patient from admittal, diagnosis, the surgery, recovery, and discharge. Right. 
And that gives them this huge view of the world, which is very different and also shows them how the actions of one affect the actions of right. the next person that they hand that patient right. off to. So that's that, that process. And, uh, the surgeries we partner with Hogue Hospital, Saddleback Memorial. We have one coming up in uh, March at Saddleback Memorial and also, uh, Kaiser Permanente. And at their facilities, we bring in students and we stage it. It's a little theatrical looking, but a staging. <laughs> and they have the, the different rooms that, that right. this patient would go through and that whole process. And a video of an actual surgery is a part of that. Kids do get sick to their stomach. They leave <laughs> like, the like room. It's, like it's real. Like it's real. And what was really fascinating to me, because I was part of the editing team of those videos to to monitor and measure the, the amount of, of graphicness and privacy issues right. and so on. And um, the the thing is, these are not that graphic to have young people really get affected that way. But it's because there's a live body there. See, you watch it in the movies or you see it on TV. But there's actually you're a body eating lane. popcorn right in front of you and you're not there. This is a human being who they heard talk to the doctor, give their symptoms see the um the x-rays and the ct scans of that person and walk that experience with that patient mm -hmm. and then go into the operating room and they are doing these small incisions inserting the tube and some of the kids just they can't take it and they have to leave the room and right. that's good to know before you go into medical school and then figure <laughs> it out but you also see opportunities that you didn't know exist yeah, because you may still want to go into medical, but you didn't think about being an x-ray tech. Right. Or being an anesthesia, or right. being some other right. role that they're not seeing. Or a sterile tech that's in the operating room with a minimal certificate at, at, a, at an early stage, which you can then be going to work and working in your industry while you pay for your medical school to become that nurse or to take right. your, your career on further. Right. So those are really important things for them to see what are those entry-level positions that you can get right. with with some post-secondary school experience, but not a full-on degree. Yeah. And you can be working in your industry, which gives you that networking, gives you that, that um, resume building that you wouldn't otherwise if you were working in a totally unrelated field Right. all together and then now you want to apply for the next level up and and they go yeah but you're competing against um well i always say now today this is really different today you're competing against your peers right your parents and your grandparents yes there are three active generations in the workforce today right and so young people are at a disadvantage in that regard because the the, uh, the competition is is the very of, very different. And if you have no work experience at all in anything, you're at the bottom of the list. If you have work experience in a different industry sector, it moves you up. In experience in your industry sector that you want to go in it moves you up. It moves you way up. Yeah. And then they like the young mind, but they also don't want to be training you from scratch either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because we're in Orange County, California. And uh, I know because my sister's uh, got a couple young kids and one of them's getting ready to go through the college circuit mm -hmm. and looking for schools. And I spoke at a group of 75 assisting young girls a couple months ago at the mm -hmm. church. Uh, and all of them were looking at colleges and universities and mm -hmm. all of them were talking about they wanted to go to Brown and Harvard mm -hmm. and Stanford mm -hmm. and Yale and all these mm -hmm. schools and the parents were there, you know, helping them write all their things. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what's the best school for right. your child, for what they want to do, be. for what their right. passion to do is, what? to do what, right. not just they to went, be what? not, not just right. they, not that they just went to Harvard or Yale or right. any school. Right. I don't care what in the school, mm -hmm. um, but really opening parents' eyes to the fact that mm -hmm. it may not be the best route for your child. There may be something mm -hmm. else they want to do. Right. And, and, but, but picking that right school, Picking that career that's where your passion is, those yep. are the important things. Yeah, yeah we, we've had a lot of um, conversations, I'm going to put it that way, <laughs> with educators. And at, at a time period when, when I first really got into this field um, is, look, they can figure it out. They just need a college degree, right? And get that a was the model. Get, or, that, when or I went to just, school, it was just get a degree in get something. Get a degree, something, right. There was a... We're me our measurable is to get you out of high school with a diploma and get you into a college. The, the school didn't care what college or why. 
and then it's yeah okay get through college and graduate from that now you go out and 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 find your way and you just can't afford to do that anymore and fortunately our school systems have changed Mm -hmm. that that is no longer the mantra they've they finally got it oh great yeah we in in internally we call it the big duh but uh (laughs) the big duh uh uh-huh yeah but they they got it and now it is they call it pathway driven where you can take classes that align and move you through the educational system, but giving them opportunities to get out into the field, have these experiential opportunities uh, to learn about what these uh, possibilities are, and then really amped up um, the classes at the high school level so that they can really learn what's going on. And there's another educational level called the regional occupational programs Mm -hmm. and those ROPs are embedded in the high schools and they focus on these types of classes where medical classes and the uh, professional classes that they can learn uh, and say you know what I'm thinking this is not for me or I want to narrow my direction a little bit but you can do it better they figure that part out that preliminary direction in high school than investing in in uh, college the colleges so think about your roei exactly and the and the dropout rate after a freshman year in college is for pretty high yeah and so you don't want that to happen you yeah. want them to be in the right program in okay. the right school um and with a, a with a direction that really fits that individual so so before, we're going to take a quick break mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll come back and we'll keep chatting about this yeah. because i think this is really important for folks out there um first kathy tell us your name and then how we find vital link yeah. if you can please spell it for us sure kathy johnson and the uh, look, the website is um, vitallinkoc.org. And so that's got double L's in it, V-I-T-A-L-L-I-N-K-O-C dot O-R-G. Great. We'll come back and talk about your vision and we'll talk about the academy that's coming up, but yeah, some other things great. as well. So great. Thanks. When it comes to pioneers in their respective industries, We all know the Apples, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's of the world. In the realm of recruiting, Decision Toolbox is the industry's best-kept secret. With 90% of their business from referrals and repeat customers, for over 20 years, Decision Toolbox's U.S.-based team of recruiters, sourcers, professional writers, quality personnel, and tech support has perfected a Six Sigma approach to talent management. No matter the size of the project, Decision Toolbox delivers incredible results, a cost per hire less than half of what contingency firms charge, with the winning candidate presented in an average of 14 days, all with a 12-month candidate warranty. With results like that, Decision Toolbox won't be a secret for long. Visit us at www.dtoolbox.com for more information. Imagine what it would feel like to lose everything, your job, your home, your family, your dignity. This has happened to thousands of the men, women, veterans, and young adults we serve at Working Wardrobes. What do we do to help? We provide career development services, life skills workshops, job skills training. We provide the perfect interview outfit, and we get clients placed in jobs. Call Working Wardrobes, 714-210-2460. Donate, volunteer, invest, hire. All right, let's pick it back up with Patty and her guest. Yeah, this is Patty, and I'm with Kathy Johnson. She is CEO of an incredible nonprofit organization called Vital Link, and they create the link between industry and education. And she's really been doing and done some amazing things with helping schools and children get real life experiences, like building a house or watching a surgery, an actual surgery take place so they can see the careers available to them in the medical field. So um, what was the vision you brought to Vital Link, and then how mm-hmm. are you implementing this vision to have an impact on organizations, education, mm-hmm. and then the students that you serve? So initially it was to take the model that we did with the construction industry, and that's that the pathways and the, and the project-based learning, and bring those other, bring those into other industry sectors. But it's very difficult to change um, bureaucratic institutions, government, you Ed- know, and, education, and yeah. education and regulatory agencies and so on. And so it, it's a, it's an interesting thing. And, and it's, I use a theory that I call the nibble theory and also uh, building outside in. 
So, okay. so it, it's a huge group to tackle because you're not only dealing with local, but you've got county, you've got state, and you've got federal agencies that oversee education. And so we decided to start outside in and create compelling programs. Okay. And invite those that were already believers in the process, of which there were. Good tactic. And when those folks came in, and we started with the surgeries, uh, that was really our first uh, thing beyond the, the construction pathway program, which was already, um, the academy was already in existence, but we wanted to tap into other industry sectors. So we started with medical, we started with TV production and partnered with PBS television and had the students produce their own TV show. We uh, partnered with the building industry and took them out to these construction sites, the medical facilities. And so we found partners who were willing to work with us to give them an experience, not your normal field trip, not your mother and father's walk through the job shadow day where you go into this thing, walk down the halls, watch people do their jobs, have somebody speak to you, but to really show them what they do by doing it yourself. And that was the model that we started with. And opening that, and opening that up. The, uh, but as, and, and then building relationships with each of the school districts. And about that time, they, we, we started an organization, um, within our organization, a collaborative Mm -hmm. and invited all of this, uh, career technical education directors to come together. And we partnered with, uh, Newport Mesa School District and ourselves. And Mm -hmm. we, Mm -hmm. they were, their leadership was, a major role in in the development of this in that in that stage and we hosted those we wrote grants and got some funding and brought those folks together and got them used to meeting together we did a an advisory board where we brought in mm-hmm. industry and the ROPs the regional occupational programs said wow this we learned a lot more in this than the advisory boards that we are doing and we said can we look at a regional approach to this, where we bring in all mm-hmm. of the medical teachers at the high school ROP and community college level to attend this, and we will bring in the top people from mm-hmm. Kaiser and the and the memorial system and and elevate the 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 nature of that. And so that took off, and they loved it, and we continue to do that um, with the various different industry sectors. So getting into the schools that way, where they found a valued added product or mm-hmm. service. Um, got us entree into then starting to think about how do we bring on these, um, these work, or these project based learning programs like the, the design build competition with the construction industry. And UCI stepped in and they said, Kathy, we have students that design beautiful things, none of which are buildable. Yeah. They can't get jobs. <laughs> it's all in a computer. They're pretty, but they don't work. They, that's right. <laughs> and we got a problem. And I said, you know what? And it was the professor there. And I said, Mike, we have high schools that design very functional things because we've spent a lot of energy and support to get advanced manufacturing equipment into the high schools and transform the shop classes the way we did the construction technology classes. Amazing. Or the, the construction shop classes. Now we have engineering shop classes. And I said, they build functional things, none of which are beautiful. <laughs> we have a perfect marriage. We shook hands, <laughs> hugged, and said, let's make something happen. And oh, I started love it. the, uh, they had a program called Energy Invitational. Right. It's a university level curriculum. And we said, let's bring your university curriculum into the high school. And the students were challenged to build a car. Now yep. these are not legal street worthy cars, but more race car, um, ex- sophisticated go-karts, <laughs> but with an energy <laughs> focus. And the goal was how far, how fast, in one hour on a dollar's worth of energy, which was what Mike said is the impossible challenge. You're yeah. given something how that is far, not easy. How, how far, far? How, how far fast? In one hour on a dollar's worth of, of energy. Any kind of energy you want. Now, nah, with the exception of pedal power. We didn't have, you know, the kid pedal. Right, yeah, right. No, none of that. Tricycle power. They wouldn't get very no, fast. No, not going very <laughs> fast. But we had the these engineering programs in some cases, partnered up with the auto shop classes right. that were starting to become more sophisticated. In others, the engineering classes took them on themselves. We have solar cars. We have compressed gas cars. We have hybrids. And the only differentiator, not grade level, your high school, 
your university, you're competing with university. You're equal competitors. It was the weight of the vehicle. That was the differentiator. Lightweight vehicles versus heavyweight vehicles. And those were the, the, the major factors. So that modeling we took into other things. And we have uh, the uh, same university, same professor. And we said, what do we do for computer programming? And he said, the impossible challenge is finding survivors in a natural terrain. And so a computer, a, a drone mm-hmm. or a robot let go operating without a manual operator. So they call that autonomously letting those go out into a park land to find survivors and then report back what they found because that's a real life challenge. Yeah. Sending drones up into the mountains and then they spot things, but how do they go about doing that? What are they looking for? What's going to be triggers for them? And so we don't expect these kids to necessarily a hundred percent solve the problem, but we want what we call a stretch goal. Now this one, we opened up to middle schools because the middle schoolers, teachers were saying, wait a minute, what about us? What about us? That's the outside in model. And that's also earning the right to advance. Yes. So you go with the champions first. Right. And then you get people that are so eager to join, yes. they can't wait to get yes. in. Those are the fence sitters that were watching what you right. were doing. And yeah. then they what go, oh, doing? what about me? What about me? Oh, no, no. Our our middle school kids can, can do this. So we have middle school, high school, community college, and university students all competing on this challenge. Differentiator, is it the ground robot or is it the drone? We have another one called the OC Maker Challenge. And this one we said, we want to get 3D printers into the schools. Mm -hmm. And this was a number of years ago when they, 3D printers just started to come out and they became affordable for, uh, for a business, a consumer business, um, or a small business to, to do with, we call it braided funding from all different sources. It came from the education themselves, money we raised, all of these different things. We gotten now over 70 plus 3D printers in middle schools and high schools and community colleges. And those students are challenged with, um, inventing a product that solves a problem or a want or a need. And they have, a, by on a minimum, yeah. they have to build a prototype using the 3D printer. We added a second layer, the, a, a static 3D prototype. The next layer is that it has moving parts in it. Okay. We added a third layer, which was that you have some form of computer programming associated to it. And over the years, we've added additional layers. And the the fourth layer is that they've used man, advanced manufacturing equipment beyond the 3D printer. Uh, and high schools and community colleges have that more sophisticated um, uh, pro, um, equipment. Mm-hmm. And now this year, we've added another one, which is that you've built an app that functions with your pro, uh, with your product. So we it's have, layered. It's year over year learning of, mm-hmm. of first you learn to walk, yep, crawl, yep. and run. run. And they're learning yes. real skills and they're yes. working in teams yes. with people that are different from them. So they're yes. learning the technical skills and they're learning the professional yeah. business skills. But so are the teachers. It's not just the students. And so, so the we counselors. offer, we offer professional development for the teachers when we add these layers or support for them to right. fund getting equipment. And those are the things that we, we add on to not only programs for the students, but it's also programs for the teachers to keep them up. And the teachers love it because it's challenging to them yeah. and they're not doing the same, same thing. And, you know, I tell this story often. I said <laughs> quite often in middle school, they have this, the, the egg drop challenge. Oh yeah. I love where you that go on one. the second story of yep. a building and you drop an egg. See in our world, yeah. that egg drop challenge would, would go like this. How many eggs? can you drop off of a second story building and not break them? It's not a, an egg. It's because that caps your innovation. Yeah. We want to take the cap off of innovation and let you go with a dozen eggs or two dozen eggs or a crate of eggs, whatever you think you can do. That incredible gives you a different, a different stretch goal. Well, I, yeah. And I know people probably listening are probably like me thinking this isn't your, your daddy's shops shop environment or your mama's home ec class no because home ec has been turned into fashion design fashion design and culinary arts and culinary arts fashion design which takes computer skills Mm -hmm. and it takes math yep cuisine takes Mm -hmm. math and computer skills because what if your recipes in a in 
you know, in European language versus American mm-hmm. language. So this is incredible to me the, of what you're doing. And it's just an, an unbelievable mission, which is one of the reasons I got involved with Vital Link. I met <laughs> one of your colleagues at a UCI event. Yes. And we started talking and he says, well, you need to meet my CEO. And I was like, okay, so great. So we actually ended up connecting. I'm actually volunteering right now for a cybersecurity academy Mm -hmm. for girls for this summer, July 16th through 20th, I believe. It's a partnership with Webster University, which I think right now I could be wrong and Brian will probably correct me, but I think Webster University is the only school on the West Coast with a master's degree in cybersecurity. So this this is a cybersecurity camp for young girls. If you want your daughters to have an incredible career, have them go to one of these programs that Kathy's organization offers or have them get into a STEM field, science, technology, Mm -hmm. engineering, math. I worked at Microsoft for 15 years. Uh, Yes, I've met Bill Gates. Yes, I've met and worked with Steve Ballmer. I've traveled the world. I had an amazing career there for 15 years, loved every minute of it, traveled every city you could possibly put on your bucket list and worked with some of the smartest people in the world. And I am not a techno geek. Mm -hmm. I'm a marketing training Mm -hmm. person. I'm a trainer. Mm -hmm. I train people how to sell stuff. I don't sell the stuff, Mm -hmm. although I did sell the stuff. But (laughs) um, so, you know, it's finding that this is such a huge benefit for kids. They're able to find a career that they love when they're in middle school and high school. So they don't have to be in college getting out of school, realizing they have a degree they can't use or being in their middle life and realizing they're doing a job they hate. It helps parents because you're. R O E I, mm-hmm. your return on your educational investment is going something your children can use, and it's helping the school system. What you're doing is phenomenal, it, it, Patty. It's interesting because with my own children, I had a, a motto: tools, not toys. What What is your What's your skill set? What's your interest? What's your passions? And I will get you the tools to use that and exercise that. That became play for them. Yeah. And I would highly encourage parents to think in those terms to see what what's the natural play of, of their children when they're really little and what kind of tools would they like to be able to exercise their talents and let them have that. But it, sometimes parents get very, um, it, it's that competitive sports and, you know, all of that kind of, I'm saying play with it. So Let we got play. my daughter, the, they had the first reel-to-reel tape recorder and reel-to-reel video tape recorder. My husband worked for CBS at the time. A long time ago, my daughter was writing TV commercials. And her brother, who wanted to be, uh, he really was a natural salesperson, very charismatic and, and yeah, you know, could yeah. sell things. She would write the TV commercials. He would be in them. And he, we, they started their own company when they were little, doing various different, you know, things yeah. and raising money. Yeah. That gave them entrepreneurial skills. It gave them skills in the industries that they both ended up with. My daughter in marketing and, and production and my son in sales, but in IT, particular, you know, mm-hmm. segment. Mm-hmm. And those that using talents to play as opposed to not necessarily the competition part of it, but the play part of it gives them thousands of hours of experience in their expertise. Yeah. And it, it's just an amazing way to let young, young children explore them. And then that helps them make that, make those connections. So they knew very young. Yeah. My son at 14, he knew he wanted to be a salesman. I mean, and, he, and he had new, been doing do- it since he was five. And your daughter knew she wanted to be in, in TV. marketing. Her well, in marketing, right. and, and her favorite character on TV was bewitched Samantha Stevens' husband, who was in the marketing. <laughs> right? He was. In, he worked for a marketing PR company. Not Samantha. She didn't identify with her. No, she identified with him. <laughs> right. And, and so with all of those things, she, we, we got a copy machine in the home before anybody had copy machines in their home. And she was making brochures and newsletters and all of that. And until she got busted at Westminster High School for having an underground newspaper. <laughs> Which is, and you probably, right. probably in front of, so I, I was coaching one of my friends the other day that has a daughter that his, his daughter got in trouble because, uh, the, she was called into the, parents were called to the school because the daughter was apparently being too hard on a little boy and, 
I said, well, when you walk out, when you were there with the with a counselor, say, yes, I know she mm-hmm. did wrong. And when you walk out the door and you go home, you say, good job, girl. Well, or you'd be a great defense attorney. <laughs> See, that's how I look at it. I go, I go to speeches at, at schools and, and I challenge the students and I say, what do you like to do for fun? What is your passion? Yep. Yep. What's your favorite thing to do that you would love to do every single day? If you woke up, that's what you'd want to do. And I will tell you 50 jobs that use that skill. And I challenge them. Well, they get exhausted before I get to the 50 count. I never have had to get to the 50 count. Yeah. Yeah. But I had kids. I like to hang out with my friends or I like to skateboard. I go, Oh, you're a team player. You like to work on teams. Well, here's all kinds of jobs where yep. people work together as teams. This is the creative team. This is this and that. And, uh, you like skateboards. Well, what about designing skateboards? You could be a skateboard engineer. You could do skateboarding in the way of events yep. and go clothing design and, and go on and on design and on. Design the, then, design the, um, the ramps, the ramps. Yes. Um, you good at math. Oh, let's oh. add that to the mix. Right. Yeah. And so those are the kinds of things that they, and they go, okay, stop, stop enough. And, <laughs> and they go, well, what about me? What about me? And, uh, that's what you, those are the conversations you need to have with your children at the yeah. dinner table. Uh, so and, say, say that question again. That's a question I think every parent should be asking their child or grandchild or niece or nephew, any child in your life. You need to ask them the question of, you know, what is your, what is, if you could get up every single day and do one, one kind of thing, what would that be? That, yeah, that brings you, know, you joy that and brings passion. You joy and passion that, that oh, mom calls you in and it's dinner time. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. It's what do you want to do? What, what yeah. would you be happy doing? Yeah. And then ignore the, t- oh, I like to play video games, right? All right. Or I like this or that. Well, what are the elements within the video games? Yeah. We did an event called Careers in Sports, Everything But the Athlete. Mm-hmm. Sports broadcasting, sports, sports medicine, medicine, which is my son was interested all in. All kinds of yeah. things, right? And there's events, the sporting events, the right. clothing lines, and and brought those people in and brought students in so they met all of right. those people. But their passion was sports. Yeah. And yeah. yet their talent was what? And yeah. now you bring those two things yeah. together. I'm actually, after the radio show today, I'm meeting a young high school student from Santa Ana High School up the mm-hmm. road at the Starbucks, of course. Um, um, that her, uh, Somebody that knows her asked me if I would t- chat with mm-hmm. her, mentor with her. And my question to her is the same kind of question. What are you passionate about? You know, make your passion your vocation and you'll be happy the rest of your life. You'll be more mm-hmm. productive. You'll be better at it. You'll find yourself doing it when nobody's watching. Those are the kinds mm-hmm. of things that parents should be talking to. Yeah. So we are almost out of time. I, I mean, I can't believe it. Oh. You and I could talk for hours. We, we, I went to, went to meet with her a couple of weeks ago or we could go and we could have talked talk for four hours. So one last question and then yeah. how can people get in touch sure. with you? Be sure. And if you want to, if you're interested in the academy, the Acad- the Cyber mm-hmm. Security mm-hmm. Academy for Girls, it is July 16th through 20th at Webster University. You can go to the Vital Link site, which our you're going to tell website, our, which is a vitallinkoc.org. And don't forget, there's double L's in the middle. And we're looking for girls that want to participate in the and camp. This, and by the way, the age range for this is important. It's high school and a community college or, or yep. fresh, um, freshman uh, sophomores of college level. So yeah. that's the uh, the age range that we're targeting for this. If you're a girl and you want to go into cybersecurity, you will make mm-hmm. a good income. You'll have something you love to do yeah. and you'll be making a difference in the world. But my last question mm-hmm. for you is what advice do you give to students or women who really want to go kick some glass? Mm-hmm. And then one more time, your name and spelling yeah. out the organization. What is your advice? Well, first, it better be something you're passionate about. Great. Because kicking glass um, there are chards, <laughs> glass chards that fall down <laughs> on top of you. We both have them. <laughs> and it's not always an easy path. So it better be something you, you really are committed. When I sold my company, um, I said, and I was looking for that next direction. I said, what did I do that I was willing to stay up all night and work on? So long hours, maybe not necessarily get a, pay, a whole lot of money initially, Uh, you know, up front on that, I'm willing to spend, you know, some free time on this. Mm -hmm. And what would that be? And what did I do in my life that, that gave me the most joy? And it was doing the uh, building and the building industry thing. When we started the The um, project based learning, project based learning in the building academy, the uh, construction competition and all of the related activities that went around that. And, um, then I had uh, a social event and met 
a lady over at the Orange County Department of Education named Lorraine Dagaford, and she was very involved in Vital Link and, and another organization called Vision 2020 at that time. And, and I became connected with her and, yeah. and then uh, served on the board of directors for yeah. Vital Link. Got my, uh, I would say, get a certificate in uh, legal and financial management. If, okay. If you've not done that before, absolutely do that. Cal State Fullerton has that great place to get that. Really important. You do not want to go down the legal or financial path that can right. get you into trouble. And uh, and then find that. But also find out who else is doing it. And volunteer. And volunteer in those organizations, which is basically what mm-hmm. I did. I, mm-hmm. I served on their board as a volunteer, Vital Link, before I became the executive director. And uh, learned what was going on and, and laid the land. And my last one is don't should on people. So my yep. shooting thing is it, I, I meet people who are very passionate, but they haven't done the research. And they don't know what's going on and they come in and so, you know, you should do this, you should do that. You really need to do your research, what's currently going on, where are mm-hmm. the cutting edge organizations, if any, that are out right. there. And then walk in humbly and listen and learn. Uh, before you start telling people how they should, should do something. Yeah. So a couple of new terms. Don't should on other people. Yes. Think about your ROEI, your yes. return on educational investment, <laughs> which is a lot nowadays. Uh, so a couple of new things that came out yeah. today. So great. One and more nibbling. T- and nibbling. 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 So Nibbling big things. You can eventually get there. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Nibble some things so you can eventually get there. That's perfect. <laughs> so Kathy, just one more time, spell the name yeah. of Vital Link for us, and sure. then we'll wrap up. V-I-T-A-L and then L-I-N-K and so Vital Link and uh, we're vitallinkoc.org and again, Kathy Johnson. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, it's been a great show. I really appreciate you being here. This is Patty Grimm. You can find me at pattygrimm at live.com and that's P-A-T-T-I-E-G-R-I-M-M. Uh, this was a great show. I think it was valuable for students, for parents, for anybody who has children in their life. Um, This is an opportunity for you to help them find that career and passion Mm -hmm. that they will love. Yes, please come join us. We have a lot of industry partners all over the county. We're just um, thrilled and would love to see more people um, engaged and focused on this. And we're looking for sponsors for the Academy. So I'll be be reaching out to a lot of my friends out there. All right. So thanks and have a super fantastic day. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Women Kicking Glass, the only radio show on OC Talk Radio dedicated to empowering women to be the best they can be. Listen each week or download the podcast at patty.grim.podbean.com. To reach out to Patty to schedule a speech webinar or to learn more about her leadership and team training, contact Patty at pattygrim at live.com. For more information about her company and her books, have a kicking day. 